Hey, let's start the show for Thursday, September 9th, 2021. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Welcome to the show this week. It is a packed, packed news week. And to go over all that stuff, it's just a duo cast. It's me and Kishore Hari. Kishore, good to see you. Welcome, everyone. Episode 616. We're finally in this universe. Yeah, we've been traversing all of the the multiverse. Uh, I mean, DC has 52 universes in their multiverse marvel has like they'll just throw up a random number in the thousands or the tens of thousands and just say that's an earth number earth x to earth you know 9999 but 616 what is the origin of that why is earth 616 the canonical uh the comic book you know uh universe um which is, it's not the real world, the universe you and I live in, because superheroes only live in comics there. But 616, I guess, is the one that, if you follow the history of Marvel Comics, that's the one all the heroes have lived through. Um, yeah, I don't know. Why, why is that? Someone, someone in the comments, let us know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to even try to explain because the Marvel stands will come after me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the Marvel stands should be happy this week um, because, well, we'll get right into it. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings debuted to a massive $94 million uh, domestic box office debut over the four-day Labor Day weekend, blowing away Labor Day records. Now, I know box office and records and watching movie theaters it's kind of a it's it's a it's 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 a touchy subject subject uh even in the best of times for people who follow follow the industry numbers but especially during the covid era all this deserves a little bit of context i don't want to dive into how this is whether this is a success relative to black widow or fast fast nine or any other uh, blockbusters that came out or are coming out but i think what we can say is, but I've seen the film. Kishore, you've seen the film. We're not going to go into spoilers today, but we can say that the critical reception has been fantastic. 92% Rotten Tomatoes. The verified audience score is at 98%. And the This Is Only a Test score of podcast hosts have seen it. Five out of five over here. Yeah, it's a top 10 MCU movie for me. Like, it to me, it's not at the level of Winter Soldier um, or Ragnarok, like the that highest of highest echelon in the MCU for me, but it's in that next tier. And I think the comp like the things you would naturally compare it to is like Ant-Man, Captain Marvel, like introducing new characters into the universe, how it fared. And it surpassed those films by leaps and bounds. And even with the qualification that the same kind of storytelling is happening here that we've seen for what like 20 films now there is some tropes that still kind of come through in every marvel film the acting from simu lu um the acting around wen wu that character was fantastic and sold a father-son story that was that had enough freshness to it that made it work and i will this is not a spoiler but I had a very similar experience when I watched uh, Black Panther in mm. the sense of this is not the story of the hero as much as the villain. And I think because mm. Tony Leung was so good. Oh, my God. Those eyes. So acting, good. Acting with smolder and scowls. So because he was so good, it really carried the film. Um, because like other elements of the film – like I can, we can quibble with like, uh, but he really is, was like carried it. And, um, and the last thing I'll say is I thought, uh, again, no spoilers. They, they showcased a fantastical element of, uh, what I love about comics for one of the first times in the MCU. Like we've seen fantastic stuff in guardians and Ragnarok to a certain extent, but, 
I'm sort of used to like the grittiness that we saw in Infinity War and Endgame. This was a little bit more like a high fantasy concept piece in places. And I thought that was it was really nice to see that um, on screen. Uh, I, I, for a comic, <laughs> the comic origins of this character are terrible. They're oh, yeah, unreadable. Yeah. Oh. And, and there are some great articles and things written about you know, interviews with you know uh, Kevin Feige and 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 the the brain trust at Marvel about acknowledging the mistakes they made in the past. You know, casting, uh, ch- kind of um, uh, swapping you know um, ethnicities for like the, the ancient one and things. That, and they were with the best of intentions trying to um, try to avoid the portrayals of of Asian cultures in in uh, the comic books and the, that the history of that the troubled history of that but what they realized is they could actually subvert those portrayals by leaning into and, and using you know appropriate casting and so you had a main cast that was all chinese from you know hong kong legend tony leung to you know canadian relative newcomer simi Liu to aquafina to newcomer uh Menger zhang uh and i think calling back to black panther is a it's it's a it's a comparison we're gonna hear a, a lot um mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's completely completely the same i I don't want to say that the asian american experience is anything like the african-american experience in this portrayals in media uh, or superhero films uh but i will say some of the parallels and i'm going to go to some criticisms i love the film but i you know i'm going to be especially critical of some of the things i think in terms of the marvel formula both black panther and shang chi do suffer a little bit from third act need to put spectacle army versus army on screen which i don't think yeah. this film nor black panther necessarily needed um and, and i would think that you know you, we get that form you we're, at this point we're done with that formula i actually like ant-man the first ant-man where the stakes yes they had a super villain and they had a showdown at the end but the stakes were smaller the stakes were paul rudd's kid right and him being a father and not being able to be a father to his child that was the stakes versus the fate of the universe earth the galaxy the beyond whatever and i think if there's anything to be critical at shang chi i think that it does fall into that formula toward the end uh the beginning though and and you mentioned the the tone of the film there's fantastical elements yes throughout uh but it almost reminded me of some of the spider-man mcu films mm-hmm. in that it was very grounded in earth and a city and spider-man being new york being a big character and spider-man tight so tied to new york i didn't expect for this film to be so connected with shang chi and aquafina and katie's character being san franciscans and that's something i really love also being a San Franciscan. I, 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 I'll post a link to it in the description, but I, I did a Twitter uh, review of the portrayal of San Francisco in the film. Spoiler free, but um, uh, people who live in the Bay Area will have a lot, a lot of fun things to look out for. Uh, so first of all, it's a crime that you haven't mentioned Michelle Yeoh, who is uh, typically great. At, like I, it's she has like a uh, a bar that I've come to expect, and she was excellent in this film as well. Um, I think we have to give. Uh, it, it, here's a criticism, not much of a spoiler. I think we find out one of the characters' names based off of graffiti on the side of a car, which is not great. Yeah, think about that for a second. <laughs> they never say his name. Uh, never before that, I, but but his even his existence is, and he's, he's in the trailer. He's the guy with the 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 blade, right? He is a token. He's the token henchman white guy in the Asian army, which is the you know the uh, flipping of the token you know martial to- artists. You're right. Totally. Which is, yeah. which is funny. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm tired of those characters overall. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there's little criticisms. You the can mini see bosses with that throughout this. I, I think the other thing was like Simu Lu is intensely likable. Oh, um, yeah. Well, and I think that's the, the hard thing about these leading roles is you have to have very different arcs like you know, Robert Downey Jr. had to create somebody likable but arrogant. Chris Evans had to create somebody that was like sweet as apple pie but tough. Um, and Simu Liu like is carving out that version of stuff. I wonder um, where this character goes if he has a place in the MCU. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and yeah, we're not like, going to talk about you know stingers like? and post credit stingers, but they've I'm talked not, about but... how Shang Chi is. He's in the advertising. He is 
the next one of the he's the meet your next avenger he's gonna be in whatever the next you know along with this new generation of superheroes from young ones you know in, in ms marvel uh to to new the, the hawkeye tv show like this is gonna be this new generation and he brings the fighting prowess that we saw from captain america right the 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 street fighting prowess mm -hmm. but also you know with maybe some mystical elements as well um before we even dive into what's next, because you know we know acknowledge and acknowledge so many people haven't had a chance to see this film yet, so I don't want to go into too many plot details. It will be in streaming services and possibly Disney Plus. Don't they haven't said whether those can be premier access or just for everyone after forty five days after the theatrical window. Um, but in terms of this representation, like one of the best things I could say about this film is these the characters. Uh, Aquafina and Simu's character, you know, Shang-Chi and Katie, they felt like characters I went to high school with. Like I everyone I saw in this film, from even Michelle Yeoh, like that's I recognize that that's an auntie I have. Like it, it felt mm -hmm. like people I knew in my life, um, which was a very warm and you know, new feeling in watching a, a Marvel film. Uh yeah. the action choreography we should talk about as well. Uh and the film, the one of the the lead action one of the lead action choreographers was Brad Allen, who came out of Jackie Chan's stunt team. And so, uh, in the trailer, you see there's a, a bus fight, which is an amazing sequence in the movie. Uh, that was that's very much uh, Jackie Chan style, early Jackie Chan style uh, fight. And that's because uh, so much of the stunt coordinators and the, the stunt team on this film came from that, that pedigree. Uh, and it was a very conscious acknowledgement uh, of that. Um, so huge props to that. There's a bunch of behind the scenes footage emerging of death dealers, like training. Mm. Um, and it is so incredible. Um, yeah. yeah. For uh, people talking about death dealer. That. That's the, the the character who wears a Beijing uh, Peking Opera mask, so it's not a Kabuki mask, uh, and um, it's an incredible. That character has incredible fight sequences, as well. Um, it's it's a shot in the trailer. It's a, it's a shot that reminds me even uh, the cinematographer of this film was Bill Pope, William Pope, who did The Matrix actually, who was a cinematographer for the first Matrix films, and um, that fight scene. Um, with the, the lit sign behind them felt like the martial arts equivalent of the uh, the James Bond Skyfall fight scene when he's fighting that sniper on the rooftop. Um, just amazing cinematography. Um, yeah, it's beautiful stuff. Uh, what about I, the, uh, the the language in this film? I, I mean, I, I, th I thought it all worked, didn't you? Yeah, I, I was taken aback. I, 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 this is like the maybe the most I'll go into spoilers, but the first, like the first opening, the prologue of the film is entirely in Mandarin, and mm -hmm. you know for director Dustin Daniel Cretton to to make that decision to make that call to say you know it almost made me think about and and, and this is a not the perfect analogy, but it's it's a bold it's bold in the same way that Wally -E was bold in opening the film without any dialogue to have this really lean into and and the characters throughout woven like, very organically in their character it wasn't just like switching between english and chinese but they spoke chinese when it made sense and they spoke english when it made mm -hmm. sense um and to have that beautiful opening completely in mandarin uh was also felt like a new thing for marvel and it felt like the the marvel fans as a whole have been very receptive to it i i think the only thing we're the only reason we're noting it is because we're so used to like studio executives knocking stuff like that down because of their concerns, because it felt so natural. It was it, like, honestly, I didn't even notice it at first because I was like, this is just a thing. It felt appropriate to like what we are seeing and um and the story that was unfurling in that again, uh, not telling any spoilers. I think the real, uh, interesting takeaway from this film is he is occupying a Captain America kind of role. So how can they arc this character in a way that is new from that, but still occupy like the feeling that centers around Captain America, which is somebody you really root for. That's somebody that holds like the moral center of the mm. universe in some way. Um, well, with a conflicted past. Can, 
Yeah, a hundred, hundred percent. Like I, I see there's like uh, elements of that character that, yeah, that are universal that need to live on, but I think they have to chart an, a new path. So it doesn't feel like a retread of a story that dominated, you know, the, you know, first half of, uh, of the MCU. Yeah. Uh, I also, also want to give huge props to the actress who plays his sister, uh, Minger Zhang, and the character is uh, Xia Ling. And uh, I've written an interview about how, first of all, the Cher is really wonderfully written. The relationship's great. Uh, she's given a lot to do. Um, but there's an interview about how uh, she chose and, and talked to the director and changed halfway through filming uh, her look. And originally her look, she had like a red streak of hair uh, on her uh, as part of her look. Uh, and um, they had a four month break because of COVID. So they allowed them to rework this script and, and, and polish and fine tune and do more rehearsals for a choreography. Um, but uh, she came back to the, the production team and said, you know, that red streak of hair is actually a, not a great trope uh, in portraying, you know, women, Asian, Asian women in, in film. Uh, it's a very generic, you know, rebellious Asian girl trope. Uh, and so Marvel agreed with her and the director agreed with her and they changed her look for the second half of filming and then CG'd out that hair uh, in post-production. So props to them for that. Um, God, there's so much I want to say about this film. And I know we're Yeah, gonna... but we can't because it's all spoiler. <laughs> okay. Last yeah. thing I'll say is Simu Lu is just a delight to follow on social media right now. And my biggest shout out is he threw out the first pitch for a SF Giants baseball game. Um, the other day and throws a perfect strike and then immediately does a bat flip, uh, backflip into like the pose. And <laughs> I was flip. just like, I was like, that is too much. Too There's much, an extra man. level. There's cameos throughout. Uh, I will throw out uh, for, for keen eye lookers, the, the do a backflip thing is, you know, that's a, that's a Marvel meme, right? That's yeah. in, in Spider-Man homecoming and the character who says do a backflip. Well, keep an eye out for that in the film. Uh, also, uh, Kung Fu Hustle. I mean, it required viewing. If even before you get a chance to watch Shang Chi, or even after, you should watch Kung Fu Hustle because there are references in both casting and action uh, and a portrayal of rings in Kung Fu Hustle that I think, and even the finale that I think are echoed here in Shang Chi, and also the Grandmaster, which is Tony Leung's uh, portrayal of Ip Man, the uh, teacher of Bruce Lee, and he did a film directed by Wong Kar Wai with Zhang Ziyi, which not just because it's him doing, being a martial artist and, and having you know his, his great acting, but the fighting style that he employs in that film um, is, is a, a soft fighting style. And that, that dichotomy between a hard fighting style and a soft fighting martial arts style uh, is actually also a theme in this film. Uh, so... Lots yeah. and lots and lots to process. We'll we'll but, dive into a full spoiler cast. At some point. Uh, I'll say one last thing. Uh, so again, this movie wasn't great, but it was pretty darn good. It like totally changed the feeling I had coming out of Black Widow, where I was just kind of like, eh, that was a Marvel movie. It was fine. Like it had its moments. This is like getting me excited again um, about the potential of what what comes ahead. Oh gosh, so it felt like through. felt like watching Star Trek two thousand nine, where like immediately after the end of this film, you're like. I want more. Give me more adventures with this cast. Maybe I mean I, the sequel. I don't know if they've officially greenlit that yet, but they, they are bound to make a sequel to this, and um, I can't wait to, to follow their adventures and journeys. Uh, well, speaking of portrayals of San Francisco and uh, actors with Asian Asian female actors with uh, colored hair, and also Bill Pope, the other big story this week is the trailer debut of The Matrix Resurrections. And what a trailer. What a trailer. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I see a face because she's making a face. I feel, okay. I feel conflicted about this okay. trailer. Okay. Trailers are fair game, so we're going to talk about this. Totally. This is uh, – so it is reminiscent of of the Mr. Anderson moments of the beginning of the Matrix film where you're in the quote-unquote real world for most of this trailer. Um, I think they lay it on a little thick. Like there are scenes where like everyone is looking at their phone and there's so many scenes about being overly medicated in this world that like prevents you from seeing the the truth. I thought that was a little thick. The Matrix has then, already, always been lay, like unsubtle. Yeah, I guess. I think the first film navigates it um, 
a little bit uh, a little bit better than I thought this trailer laid it on. So, okay, with all those qualifications, I liked older Keanu, older Neo in this. I le- I, I thought that the look was appropriate. He he like it wasn't that he's just older. You could see him carrying like a weight of, of mm. the years that had passed by and I think that came through a little bit in some of the dialogue in the trailer. Uh, he's not like the all powerful force that we saw in like at the end of one and end of two quite like he still has some fantastical powers, um, but it's not over the top. Um, I will say I got hyped when the music started to kick in at the end of this trailer. I thought like that was the thing like I was expecting to like dive in and like the electronic beat to drop and just be in like full on Matrix mode. But it like takes its time. But then when it gets there. It gets there. The and right I know side. my heart. I know my heart's gonna be broken uh, because I remember what the th- what happened in the third movie. But it's still pretty hyped. Uh, it, it, this is a fascinating trailer. One because of how important the Matrix was not only for people who got to see it in theaters and growing up, but for martial arts films bringing in. Uh, Asian cinematography, wire foo was not a, a thing, and, and changing the language of Western martial arts action films. Going, think you think about when the Matrix came out, right? This was early, late '90s. You had an era of action films that were that had martial arts in it, but you know, Jackie Chan was on the rise in terms of awareness. In the but that was a different tone. You had mostly your Jean Claude Van Dams and your Steven Seagal's being the ones representing martial arts in Western cinema, and you had then. This inventive, you know, uh, f- f- philosophy one hundred and one level of you know of, of sci-fi right, storytelling combined with that merge of um, martial arts right out of right out of our favorite Jet Li films and, and Bruce Lee films, uh, and then and, and an inventive filming with bullet time. So all of that legacy of the first Matrix movie specifically. Is on and is, is weighs on the shoulders of this film, and so Lana Wachowski coming in to not only write and direct this, eleva- to elevate that. The thing I was most reassured by were the cinematography of the action. When you have, we didn't see necessarily bullet time, but we did see Inception like you know world bending powers and and fight choreography and cinematography that looked. Look like it meets the expectations and meets the the weight of what the first film. It didn't look like as much as the plot seems to be a retelling, a a, 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 a another cycle of the Matrix. Right? Uh, it seems to be at least in being very inventive in the way they show it and look beautiful. The cinematographer isn't Bill Pope. It actually, is the same the cinematographer or the DP they started working with with Sense Eight and uh, Jupiter Ascending, which I think is a beautiful film. And this film shot on location also in San Francisco. So you see a lot of that same uh, familiar skyline for, for Bay Area residents. Uh, what do you think about the uh, the story? Like we can, I think it's fair game to theorize and hypothesize, yeah. but is this, is this reincarnation? What is this? Hey, so, I mean, first of all, they laid it on so thick with the Alice in Wonderland references. <laughs> I throughout. mean, the song is Jefferson Airplane, right? It's, it's, it, it's yeah, right there. And, uh, so... Uh, I think we saw like an Oracle level, you know, person in that context. And that it seemed like the story might be suggesting that he's really looking to um, reunite and save Trinity in some way, shape or form. And that like the trite thing that popped across my head is that his love for her is going to transcend the matrix somehow. Love the one, the single human delusion. (laughs) Yeah, and I was just I I almost vomited my in my mouth a little bit when I that thought came across my head. I don't know. It's really hard to extrapolate the story here. Um, and it, like you said, the visuals are great. The problem with the Matrix has always been the story. The story has been quite ludicrous, and we do traverse the the world of the robots and the Matrix it, itself. At least we don't see too many fantastical characters. Like the what was his name? The architect. What was that guy? The architect. Uh, yeah. 
That yeah. was terrible. But I will say Neil Patrick Harris really took me out of this trailer. I was like, yeah, what it, the hell? What it opened like a casting? parody, like an SNL bit, yeah. right? Uh, or, or one of those like Super Bowl commercials where they hire the same actors to revisit the characters they've played. Uh, but it quickly moved on from that. Yeah. Um, I think it's clear from the images they've launched, you know, what is the matrix.com again, people can find exclusive photos and, and, and short snippets that people have posted screenshots on, on Twitter from that are clearly recreations of sh iconic shots from the first film. So there's a acknowledgement of that iconography and to go back to the story of the architect, the matrix has been, you know, the way he told Neo, the Neo that we saw in the trilogy was that the, the Matrix, the idea has been uh, cyclical. It's been done many, many, many times. And the point of the one is a system of control to, to restore balance to the source, to let Zion grow, then to destroy Zion, and, and then to reborn and, and start anew. And, and um, this feels like, you know, even though at the end of the Matrix, Neo gave himself up in his Jesus pose to, to destroy Agent Smith. We saw at the end of the Matrix the the idea, the, the virtual world of the Matrix persisting. Because you had you had the Oracle chatting with the little girl about Mr. Anderson and whether he'll come back. And so I assume this movie, some of it takes place in the real world. They had shots of sentinels and ships and hover ships. And they had shots that, and it's, most of it must take place in this iteration of the Matrix. What the feeling I got, and there are two shots in this that really are weird. One is Neo looking in the mirror, and he sees an old version of him of, of someone. Mm -hmm. Am I even sure it's himself? So either it's not really Neo, and they're just like casting the essence of Neo onto someone, which would be kind of disappointing because we want as fa filmmakers or as fans to see the continuation of the story of these characters. We want these characters to be the same characters that we saw. I, I think it's not really Trinity. I think Trinity's dead. Let Trinity have died at the end of Matrix um, uh, Revolutions. And this, I feel like very WandaVision-like, is Neo's memory or projection of Trinity. Um, because Neo got reabsorbed into the source, right? Uh, as he defeated Smith, he died. So if he's reincarnated and resurrected, um, it could be in the essence his character, but I don't think it's really Trinity. And I think, you know, just like the Morpheus character played by Yaha uh, abdul Badin second here, perfect casting, by the way. Um, yep. He's so great from you know, Watchmen to, to uh, Aquaman. Uh, I, don't, I, I think it's not really those characters. And the only one that's really the same is, is the essence of Neo. Well, thanks. I hate that story. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I, I feel like this. Yeah, I I have a hard time imagining a story that picks up where um, the the trilogy finished, which was actually a, a reasonable conclusion to that story. Uh, but at the end of the day, visuals are fantastic. Uh, and as we've seen with John Wick, Keanu can carry a story by himself. And so that that sort of weariness that I saw in his eyes get gets me pretty excited um along with the yeah. visuals yeah it's funny because you have so many people a generation of film goers who did not grow up with the matrix at this point it being over 20 some odd years uh and did grow up with john wick right teenagers and and who know keanu mostly from older keanu and see this and like he looks just like john wick but with these powers now uh and i'm so curious what their perception of the matrix as a franchise and as a film is and how they will perceive this new trailer um whether they'll be conflating you know the john wick keanu reeves with the neo version of of keanu reeves uh comes out december 22nd and going back again to to shang chi it was the first movie i saw in theaters in over a year and a half and i missed it i missed the the sound system primarily the big screen and the sound system and i'll tell you even watching the matrix resurrections trailer on my big screen tv at home here i i felt like i want to go to watch this in theaters even though it'll be on hbo max it'll be hard to resist you have to watch this in the theater. Yeah, like seeing yeah. this at home is just not going to be the same. Yeah. Like there are a few movies that I think that is absolutely true for. And I think the matrix with how it's shot 
and the the sound uh, scape of this movie, I think absolutely falls into that category. Hey everyone, Norm here. Before we continue, I want to let you know that this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from ITPro.tv. Start or grow your IT career with online IT training from ITPro.tv. Did the recent ransomware attack on the gas pipeline catch your attention? It's another example of how cybersecurity professionals are in demand. There are more than 500,000 open cybersecurity roles, and you can become a cybersec pro with online training. It's never too late to start a career in IT or move up the ladder, and ITPro.tv has you covered, from CompTIA and Cisco to EC Council and Microsoft. ITPro.tv has nearly 6,000 hours of on-demand training and engaging hosts who present who present information in a talk show format. They're live every day and shows go studio to the web in 24 hours. Courses are conveniently listed by category, certification, and job role and stream ITPro.tv courses live and on-demand worldwide via Roku, Apple TV, PC, or their iOS and Android apps. Learn IT Pass your certs and get a great job with itpro.tv. Visit itpro.tv slash test to save 30% off all plans. That's itpro.tv slash test. Once again, itpro.tv slash test. Now back to the show. We're not done with San Francisco yet because it's time to go to Starfleet Command. Oh, Star Trek day. So... That we we were recording this on Thursday. We waited for the Matrix trailer to drop, uh, but we so we didn't have an opportunity to record on Star Trek Day. Why why is Star Trek Day nine eight? Is that because the, when the show premiered fifty five years ago? Is that is that right? I guess so. I guess, I guess so. Yeah, I'm, I'm a terrible Star Trek fan for not knowing, but there were celebrations, uh, cast members. There's a whole orchestra played this, this whole live stream event. You know, Star Trek now, at least in the TV form, is going strong. They've announced, you know, a director uh, for the new film that they're working on. But we had uh, outside of Star Trek Discovery, we had uh, the first looks at the cast for Strange New Worlds. Which is the Captain Pike Ensign Mount uh, story, the spinoff of Discovery, and I dig the new costumes. I dig the new casting. costumes look great. Casting Uhura is, is going to be great. there. There's a con descendant that's going to be there. Interesting. How I don't know how Descent, they're going to tie that. Descendant or prescendant, right? Like a, I don't know how uh, the no no it would works. it would be a dis- descendant because. Khan was in the eugenics wars, which is before Enterprise. He was in cryogenic well, sleep. Like, we don't know. Is it like a daughter? Is it like oh, somebody? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh-huh, like, yeah. I, like, we don't know the relation there. That's all I'm saying. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of like also minor characters from early in TOS that are showing up in this. I don't know. What, Nurse Chapel? Know. Number one gets a name? Why not? <laughs> and yeah, Benga, or like, yeah, like, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's like carrying the mantle of Spock in Uhura is already quite a lot. Um, uh, so I don't know. I, I like the casting seems uh, great. I, I, I don't know. let these characters <laughs> establish them. Let these actors establish themselves. Uh, I, I'm happy for this to be a more episodic. You know, um, less adventure of the week, please. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think that's how they're framing this. Uh, I want the adventure of the week. I, I miss that from from next gen. Um, we really moved away from that, starting with with DS nine. Um, and like I said, you know, Discovery has its own tone and has the journey of that cast. And we saw some new uh, new uniforms as well for Michael Burnham that kind of call back to the the motion picture stuff with the the big shoulder pads, uh, but. Uh, Anson Mount is super charismatic and super great as Captain Pike, and so I, I'm, I'm I, I can't wait for this. I'm excited for this. Uh, but we also saw the first full trailer for the second season, and second out of three seasons now confirmed for Star Trek Picard. And this is the one that we had a lot to say. The series that we had a lot the most to say about going into the first season, and 
Hey, <laughs> hey, so the last time you and I went to a con together, I think was San Diego Comic Con two years ago. Yeah. And when we went to the Picard exhibit and we were like kids in a candy store, we were like, oh, yeah. his flute, oh, this. And like we were so hyped. And then we saw the trailer and we're blown away. And while I had my reservations about them introducing Q in the teaser for this, I was like, it's, it's Patrick Stewart. It's Patrick Stewart and Jean-Luc Picard. This is going to be amazing. And then I watched this trailer and I was so thoroughly upset and frankly <laughs> disgusted by what I saw in this trailer oh, that I wow. almost shut off the trailer. <sighs> this was so derivative and unimaginative. And I'll, I'll just lay out if you haven't watched out the trailer. Basically, there's a time travel arc. And in as we've seen in so many episodic versions of Star Trek, they travel to the past and they have to fix something in the past to remedy something in the future. Uh, and they travel to a version of the past that is a dystopian um, or hard, um, hard for us uh, as a allegory to our current mo moment. And mm. this played mm. it up to the nth degree, but without the, the charisma and nuance of man with the high castle or um, what's the new Ronald Moore um, show that's oh, on Apple TV. Know. That's also doing it where the, it's like the Soviet Soviets oh, with the oh, space race. Oh, same yeah, yeah, concept. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. For all mankind, for all yeah. mankind, same basic arc. And when the moment that you see Picard in, in like kind of a totalitarian state in the past, I was like, no, thanks. I was, I was just like, no, thanks out of this here's the issue I have with the direction they're taking with that show as a whole is, and it may be too much of a burden we put on, on Patrick Stewart and he is getting older, but they're writing this and developing this as an ensemble show, as a traditional Star Trek show. And I think a lot of fans and fans of next generation didn't necessarily fall in love with those characters of the first season. They really served their purpose with the story they were trying to tell. And the fact that I think fans, I think we want we would be fine with a show that was all Picard all the time, Patrick Stewart, let him act, 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 and bring in John Delancey. Yes, bring in Borg Queen. Fine. I, I love the casting uh, um, uh, uh, for Borg Queen, but it seems like they're trying to make this a, 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 a less of an event show and more of like, here's just another Star Trek show. When if you have Patrick Stewart for three seasons to tell the final story of, of, of Jean-Luc Picard, make it feel like an event, make it feel like not just another TV show. And this felt like just another TV show, especially with the conceit of going back to 21st century America that just screamed, we're out of budget and we need to film in LA. You know, that's, that's what they, you know, yeah. the Voyager ep episode, it, it, it didn't have Voyage home vibes or anything like, and, and I, yeah, I, 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 I'm not 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 very happy with this. An actor at the level of Patrick Seward uttering the line, we have three days to save the future without like any verb um, or like real uh, stakes. I was just like, uh, I couldn't be less excited. I yeah. will say I hope I'm wrong. I love this character is beloved to both of us. Um, and uh, there. There's so much charisma that John Delancey brings to the portrayal of Q that I think could carry the show if like the story is there. It's just this this trailer doesn't give give you much indication there is a ton there. Yeah. <sighs> I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hopeful, but and I'll watch it. But this trailer did not inspire me in any way. I had the same reaction that we had filming that reaction video, except it was in frustration, not excitement, running around and spinning in circles. <laughs> so, ah, Star Trek Picard, and oh, you know, I'm enjoying Lower Decks. I, I'm, I'm enjoying and the uh, the new animated show with um, with Janeway coming back. I'll, I'll give that a try as well. I think right now, Strange New Worlds is on the top of my list of Star Trek shows. I'm excited about uh last couple things um uh what if has been ongoing i know there's a big marvel zombies episode this past week we haven't watched it yet but um i did like the one they had last week with dr strange i thought that Ooh. was a, a dark dark episode packed a wallop an emotional yeah. wallop i thought it yeah. was um 
Uh, they really have um, each episode has kind of leveled up from that kind of bland first episode. Um, In retrospect, yeah. Uh, and so it, it just really love how they're stretching the storytelling and not just telling these kind of like neat tied up in a bow stories with what if too like they they really stretched in this doctor strange one and i um and i loved it i loved it so much yeah uh and uh in other non-marvel news but in pop culture news kind of blending in with technology we have the return of abba this now was <laughs> so strange okay so we'll give some context and I'll fully admit, I'm not the world's biggest ABBA fan. I'm aware of their significance in pop, in pop music, and in you know, in, in, in certainly the, the the films that they have made based on their music and, um, and Eurovision. Um, but they're it's an aging pop band that has been beloved by so many people. Returning for a new album, which some some of their tracks have been released, but then to go on tour. Not to travel the world, but they're building a stadium to do a holographic show. You know, this started off with Tupac on stage. You've seen, like, I, I think they're doing a, uh, is it a Whitney Houston one as well in Vegas. But the whole Blade Runner 2049, we're going to get there way before 2049. The Blade Runner uh, Vegas, you know, holograms playing on stage as, as nostalgia kicks. And, and uh, the movie, uh, what was the movie, the animated film with Robin Wright? Um, the Congress about actors and personas getting scanned to have digital recreations. The Al Pacino film, Simulation One, Simone, like that is all becoming reality. And ABBA have partnered with ILM to uh, capture them in performance capture and motion capture, although also with body doubles, to port put on a live holographic show that they'll be playing for people for paying audiences people will buy tickets to go to a, a custom built theater music venue where lights will blend with holograms and the album will play and i don't even know if ava will be in attendance if the the corporeal forms will make it out every night to wave and say hi or if they're just gonna if people are be paying big bucks to watch exclusively the holograms perform i it's not clear um, so this started out normal where you're like, oh, aging rock band, uh, aging band coming back to release a new album. And then it just went goes off the rails in the most bizarre way. So like they did this really intense mocap, uh, according to some of the behind the scenes stuff, so that they've captured basically every move that this this, uh, you know, uh, 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 group has so they can recreate them. And then they release a trailer um, you know, with a song attached where you see the the kind of CGI, the generated images of them. And there's like a little bit of Tarkin vibes you get when you see them, but it's lit in a way that it's a lot better than how it was. Um, but it's also just eerie. There's still something not quite human about it. There's like still something a little off where they don't look perfect. Well, but then when you think to... Yeah. When, when you think about it in a concert setting, you, you're so far away oftentimes. When you put them on a screen, they're on a screen at that point. So, like, it's probably not noticeable in person. But then the really strange comments come. But I, I'll, I'll wait for the real, the really strange <laughs> until your reaction. I, I, and, and I think you're right that because it's a concert setting and it's not on the big screen, you know, it, it makes me think about how – in some cases, in concert settings, people have used uh, have used auto tune or used um, uh, lip syncing, right? And what people are really paying for when they go to a concert venue are they paying to see something exclusive? Are they paying to see a person in person? You're in the same room, quote unquote, as your favorite performer. Or are they paying for two hours of energy and the celebration of music with fellow fans, like so much of the concert going experience is the energy that other fans provide. And it's a communal thing, just like going to the movie theaters. And so I, I feel like people who are paying for this aren't going to have any problems with the fact that it's not them in their physical form. They're still going to enjoy the music and this unique visual experience. 
Well, supposedly the demand has been really high off the charts on the first couple of days. So then the director comes out and says, like, I think this show could run for 30 years. Uh, and it was like, and you're like, what does that mean? Because, like, don't you just play the same songs over and over again? And he goes, well, we recorded some new songs that we'll introduce every few months or every, like, little bit of time. And wow. so that will change the show. And then, I, like, it start. it's... And now I kind of want to see it because it's such a weird experience. This isn't the hologram of Tupac. This no. is oh, an evolution beyond that. Yeah, and yeah. I'm yeah. so, so curious about this. I am not an ABBA fan at all. I think I would just stand there the whole time just like squinting at what I'm seeing. But like I'm fascinated by this by this thought but it's so filled with like hubris too at the same time it's like we're gonna we're gonna mocap ourselves and just auto generate uh, a version of ourselves and i don't think they're gonna be there do you think they're gonna be there i don't, I don't think, think i think they'll be there. there maybe for the opening night and maybe some surprise appearances yeah. but there's no i don't think there's a, an actual expectation for people buying tickets every night to be able to see abba physically in person they're going to see the holograms i think you're right that it's different from tupac and that that was recreating performance from someone who had passed but here uh the fact that they're doing dlc essentially that they're planning for concerts when they say 30 years i mean that's like a kind of a morbid thing to say because the the yeah. subtext is that some of abba may not physically be alive or around at that point um when that show goes on 30 years from now and you think of any artist performing who can say wow maybe i'm uh i'm super popular i'm a cultural icon i've got i've done my tour i don't it's tours are physically exhausting but they can spend a year or a couple months producing doing the performance capture the mocap for albums and capturing themselves in their pure digital digital form sign away the rights get paid up front retire for life and their legacy lives on I mean, you could absolutely seeing this this being a thing. You go back to the Bourdain documentary, uh, and and the director is talking about generating voices, um, and even you know in the Mandalorian, the the biggest thing that came out of the one of the biggest things that came out of the gallery episode of the making of that final episode of Mandalorian with spoiler alert, Luke Skywalker is not that his face and his his it was was a deep fake or CG, but that his dialogue was one hundred percent computer generated that his dialogue it wasn't mark hamill recording it and then de-aging it and then tuning it it was a complete facsimile using sound bites and and, and using an, a computer generated version a deep fake equivalent of audio and the fact that they could probably do that for music that is so bizarre that is fascinating and bizarre and unsettling but i'm sure will be the norm for for a generation of concert goers in the future and I'm expecting it to be a little bit of a train wreck. And that's why I want, I'm like curious about it more than anything else. Like, I, I, it, because this is the uncanny valley. And, and so I kind of want to go sit in the middle of the valley and just <laughs> and, and be in the middle of it. Um, I mean, there's no way I'm actually going to go to this because it's in London and it's going to be so expensive and all that kind of stuff. But I am very curious about it. Yeah, and yeah. frankly, they're not really leading with the tech. Most of the the stuff is like ABBA's but coming back, but they don't really lead that they're coming back as these motion capture stuff. It just becomes obvious. Well, for for people who follow, you know, tech and, and yeah. ILM and on, on Twitter, certainly we see the Tron avatars of of ABBA, and that's what we're hooked on. But I, I think you're right. Like the 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 standard ABBA fan who just is excited for a new album, you know, will there be mismanaged expectations? Will they go and, or not know, will they have no, you know, no idea that it's holograms, you know, that that's really curious idea as well. Um, all right, we're going to skip to our final story because we're running short on time. And uh, one, there is an Apple event next week. They've announced next Tuesday. It's the September Apple event. I don't know about you, Kishore. I am not ready. It came way too quick on me that we're already in September. And every September for the past 10 years, we've had a new new iPhone. And I my my brain is not ready for a new iPhone. That just that is that marking of time and how long we've been in lockdown and, and working from home, two iPhone launches worth is something that really is jarring. 
I actually am excited for the normalcy of having a September announcement, but I also think it's hilarious that uh, Twitter already moved on to the iPhone 14 before the 13 was <laughs> announced in terms of the hype. Uh, I like I am not super uh, excited about the phone launch in, in particular because it, it like all the rumors suggest this isn't going to be like a massive upgrade uh, compared to what we saw going from you know, 10 to 11, and even to a certain extent, 11 to 12 in terms of the camera technology. Uh, so I'm expecting a ho-hum, but Apple usually comes away with like one thing. You're like, huh, I wasn't expecting that. I really thought air tags a little bit operated, like <laughs> oh, occupied boy. a little bit of that space last year. Here's an air tag still in, still in the wrapper from last year that I bought the the four pack and have not found a use for it. Someone I, tell me what to do with this AirTag. I, I'm not saying it's all positive, but it was definitely like a, huh, I'll think about that a little bit kind of thing. And so do you have any expectations on what that could be this year? Well, the rumor is going to be it's a big product lineup. So they have to sell new products, a new phone for yeah. sure. A new iPad mini is the expectation as well, using the new design that will probably sell very well for students and families who have you know, who can afford the iPad or you know, working from home. Uh, a lot of pro users are waiting for the MacBook Pro 16 inch using the M1 X chip, yep. right? Or whatever it's called. So that's going to be a big seller for holidays. So it feels very strong from that uh, product cycle standpoint. Um, the la- not seeing anything AR in their last announcement from the summer tells me, and given the California dreaming streaming, sorry, uh, iconography that they use with the floating logos. I bet the one more thing isn't a product announcement, but is the first glimpse of their first AR glasses, which they've said, or at least the reports have said, that uh, that will be the pass-through AR, you know, still dev kit, high, very expensive, maybe even limited quantities, but to, to get devices in the world. And the timing is particularly apt because just today, Facebook announced the fruits of their previously announced uh, relationship with Ray-Ban, which is their first um, glasses, not Oculus branded, Facebook Ray-Ban glasses. They're basically the Snapchat spectacles, and they call them Ray-Ban Stories, 300 bucks. It's Google Glass all over again. And to not go into the the, the response and, and feedback of it so far, these are glasses with cameras on them, privacy first, as they say, also work as Bluetooth headphones for, for phone conversations. But it's about the fact that both these companies, Apple and Facebook, have AR as a, a target in their pipelines. But unlike the phones, these are devices that n- mandate real-world testing and of, of the SLAM technologies. Uh, and you can't do that in a lab. You can't do that hidden with a, a, a fake phone in a, a, a iPhone 4 in a, in a bar type case. Uh, and so they have to tell their investors and the world, be prepared. We're going to have our first iteration of this, not for consumers, not for our, for most people, but out in the world so that we can continue to product develop for the thing that will eventually be the next you know, they're in their hopes, the next iPhone type product category. Yeah, I, I think inevitably we're going to hear a lot of Google Glass comparisons. And I think that's not terribly interesting. This is I'm really curious how this fits into with where Snapchat was going with the spectacles, which was um, first a hardware issue, not just from like the the slam technology, but something creating that was lightweight that felt as light as a pair of glasses, which are now because of upgrades in lens technology over the last 20 years, pretty light. And so the, um, the story about Facebook and Ray-Ban, what I think is interesting is how they say it only weighs a few grams more than like a normal pair of Ray-Ban. So I'm kind of interested in how they're able to miniaturize from that sense. And it's not just Apple and Facebook. Google's doing stuff in this space too. Like, yeah. and, and so I like it's, they're all bracing each other in a lot of ways and they're approaching it from slightly different ways. They have very different software mentalities around this, but what I'm primarily looking for first and foremost, acknowledging all those software things is what is the hardware look like? What are the hardware advances? So what I want to see in the first glimpse from Apple whatever it is, and everything from the imagery from this event indicates they're going to talk about AR, is they don't just talk about the the benefits of the AR 
um, uh, uh, platform, which they've done in the past, that they show us a glimpse of hardware that articulates the design future and the hardware future of this as well. I think I think you're going to be disappointed with the Apple. I know I'm going to be disappointed. Because I think Apple has strongly telegraphed and in the reports that the first generation pass-through will be clunky and the optics are not uh, up to what they have done. And in fact, I would go to say that Facebook's announcement, the the early announcement to, to undermine Apple's announcement uh, is to show something that is more, uh, looks more like a standard pair of glasses, even though they're completely different products. If we're talking about, again, this is all speculation for, on our part. If we're talking about an Apple pair air glasses that are passed through AR to test world mapping, to test pass through uh, overlap, overlaid visuals, you know, the wearable equivalent of what you can do with your phone as you hold it out with AR apps on your phone, uh, that is not what these Ray Ban glasses, Ray Ban glasses are much more akin to Snapchat spectacles, the first, second gen, and also Google Glass. And Google Glass is a very apt analogy, but both of these devices and companies will face the challenge of public perception. Google faced it firsthand. It tanked glasses as a whole because of who the early adopters are, how they were using mm-hmm. it. And even then, the we weren't as aware as a society of the, the risks of privacy and the risks of of, of always on video capture, these will be the big hurdles. And to change that conversation, I think it's going to be a huge, huge, huge hurdle and roadblock for both these companies. Uh, their marketing teams are working overtime to look at the missteps of Google Glasses and try to bypass. And I don't think they've so far succeeded. So I I, I agree with everything you're saying, but but if the event next week is simply us looking at AR through the lens of a phone or the iPad Pro, and we don't get a glimpse of something that is an iteration of a separate category of hardware, then I I don't think we're really advancing the conversation much. And they, Apple telegraphs all the time with their invite. And, you know, this is a logo of the uh, Apple logo that you can zoom in on and see a totally different world. And if it's only that through the lens of the phone, I'm going to be disappointed no i don't think it's going to be the lens. i think it will be a yeah. wearable thing but i just don't think it's going to be anywhere near as sleek looking as oh the ray-ban glasses or the snapchat spectacles because they're fundamentally different types of devices on the roadmap uh yeah it, it, i i agree but it doesn't need to be sleek it doesn't need to be like uh an an iphone uh, you know six compared to like the original iphone but it has to give us a glimpse of what of where their direction is going. Even if it's clunky, you get you get elements of their direction just by looking at how they've designed the hardware. And if Apple doesn't get the design element, it doesn't incite your imagination around design, then what are we even talking about here? I think it's going to be uh, things that you wear like headphones and you flip them down because... Uh, ugh. Well, the pass through AR is going to look like VR to start, and at least yeah. VR to what Facebook and Oculus have done. Their credit has made VR uh, acceptable as a mainstream thing. It's not weird to see someone wearing Oculus, you know, Quest twos, you know, out in public even, uh, and certainly not at home. It's not a weird thing. Like the, the content is compelling enough, um, and so I think it, Apple will frame it as you know these are VR glasses, but they're really just. AR pass through, you know, in development uh, for whenever they solve the optics issue problem in AR, um, and and they won't be three hundred dollars as the Facebook Ray Ban glasses are. The Facebook Ray Ban glasses are three hundred bucks, so that people and, and they need to sell the use case of these five megapixel cameras and thirty second video clips being a, a really useful thing, uh, which I think I don't think Google Glass ever succeeded in being you know, telling that story. Um, but they need to get those out in the field so that people feel comfortable as a society wearing these glasses and other people wearing these glasses so that whenever their, their area glasses come out, it won't be as jarring on a next step. Yeah, so much about the Ray-Ban in Facebook announcement is about Ray-Ban as much as it is about um, uh, Facebook. Mm-hmm. Because like Luxottica, which owns pretty much every eyewear brand that is used in the in the world, is also looking to expand. So this is not just simply um, about uh, the technology side of things. Yeah, yeah. 
Huh, all right, that's a lot to cover, and certainly next week we'll have a lot more to cover because it'll be after that Apple event. Uh, personally, if Facebook Ray-Ban wants to send me a pair of these Ray-Ban story glasses, I'll be happy to test them out in in the real world and and share my impressions. So anyone listening, get in touch. You can always reach me uh, uh, at normanattested.com. Uh, and that does it for this episode, Kishore. Great to catch up. I can't wait till we get more time to talk about Shang-Chi. Um, maybe, maybe after Jeremy watches it at some, maybe 45 days. 45 days feels like the right time. So in, in a we'll month's time, a, we'll dive. We'll do yeah. a spoiler cast, certainly before the Eternals come out. How about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, and I'm yeah. also excited about some of the tech stuff coming. It feels like we're in uh, like a couple month cycle when we're going to see new products launch. We saw Amazon release the TV. Pixel 6 is coming out in a couple weeks. So there's stuff coming and I'm excited to uh, to have more just uh, gadgets and stuff to talk about as opposed to like lawsuits and, uh, you know, IP battles. Uh, so which is dominated the, the summer cycle of tech news. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm going to throw an outro in after we sign off. But until next time, see ya. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. Norman and I shared that moment together. We're like, oh, no, people listen to this. So yeah. Good. And uh, I want to apologize to you out there who are listening. I'm never apologizing never for the mayor. Okay. Never apologizing for the mayor. What's the context here, guys? We were just on a conference call and like somebody's like, yeah, I listen to your show. And I'm like, oh, you listen to Still Entitled, right? Like, no, I listen to this only a test. What? <laughs> huh? No. Huh? Test it.